May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. He was baptized by John, confirmed by the proclamation of the Almighty, confronted with the opportunity to dodge the responsibility. And by the grace of God, he walked out of the wilderness of apathetic ambiguity and started to honestly do the ministry that he was personally called to do. He started to spread the good news about the promise and possibility of the miraculous life that is immediately available to anybody and everybody whenever they're ready to honestly receive it, overcome their own personal proclivity to dodge the calling's responsibility, and likewise begin the compassionate ministry of reconciling the world to God through Christ. <clears throat> it's the typical response to perceived difficulty. What can I do to make this easy? Or, if necessary, effectively avoid it altogether. Because if there's something that I'm essentially afraid to do, finding a way to not do it is the most seemingly effective way to pacify my fear and let me continue to be passively and inactively comfortable. And more typically than not, that's the place where we experience the insidious activity of spiritual pathology and death. In other words, that little voice in your head that rationalizes a way for you to not really do the calling of Christian ministry, that's the devil talking to you. And the voice, that's familiar to you as your own. And you and me are no more immune to it than Jesus was when he received his call to ministry and subsequently stepped up to hear and to do it. Attempting to talk ourselves into complacency just comes with the territory of the call of Christian ministry. Our first responsibility in the body of Christ is to honestly recognize that and directly deal with it as a people who are ready to personally grow into the apostolic activity of transforming the world in holy love. You know, there are essentially two principal commandments in Christianity. One, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And two, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that Christ has commanded you, which inevitably refers you directly to the first. Anything else, anything that distracts us from doing this simple but difficult call that we are committed to, Anything that serves to provide us with a rationalization or fabricated reason to deny or avoid what this means for us as a people who are baptized into the faith. Anything that serves as a means to justify how we don't need to personally do the worship, charity, service, and evangelism that is fundamentally essential to our faith. Anything that does that, that is the antithesis to what we are put here to do as the body of Christ resurrected and given to the world to bring the world to true life. The fact is that we are all very, very talented in our personal ability to talk ourselves into ways to get out of what we don't think that we want to do. And we have an arsenal of positions and points of view that readily serve to justify how we might choose to not do it. From self-righteous indignation to impracticality to personal claims of our own unique inabilities and shortcomings, we all know how to make a case to ourselves of why we do and don't do what we do. 
But the fact of the matter is, what we're called to do remains the same as it will continue to. And the people who are called to do it are you and me, not someone else that we think that we might be able to creatively get to do it for us as a sort of religious proxy or outsourced agency of the faith. Ministry is a gift that we share as a community of believers, and there is no substitute for personally receiving that gift and living it in the flesh and blood reality of our own personal lives. But in the wilderness of self-doubt and perceived inadequacy, or the desert of fear-fueled, tenuous commitment to the ministry that necessarily comes with membership in the body of Christ, in that wasteland of misperceived spiritual incapacity, there is good news of promise and possibility. The way out of the conjury of being lost and wandering aimlessly in the uncharted territory of apathy and inactivity is rather simple and readily available. Just follow the directions that we repeatedly overlook in our avoided attempts to reroute the journey. The main road is amazingly close whenever you're ready to turn onto it and honestly follow the map to life in the heavenly kingdom. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, and make disciples of all people, teaching them to do the same. It's just a matter of approaching the faith with honesty, which is the tried and true remedy for effectively navigating the uncertainty of being lost in the territory of temptation. Turn around, step back into reality, and simply start to do the activity that we so readily embrace in theory but so frequently try to desperately avoid. Give thanks to God, live in love and charity, and personally and courageously share the gospel with the world at every opportunity. When we do, the deceptive dishonesty of doubt and fear will have no place to be. Because you and me will be too busy living the ministry of the body of Christ and the wilderness of temptation will be lost in the community of life in the kingdom of heaven. Start to live faithfully and faith will become what you and me live anytime and every time we're ready to find the courage to be honestly faithful and live the faith that we are honestly called to truly live. Live it and see. Temptation and fear, they have no authority. When we have the courage to be the resurrected body of Christ that we are called to be in the witness and ministry of God's most holy compassion and love. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.